Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you all here, family, friends, and colleagues, to celebrate the extraordinary life of Carter H. Manny, Jr. My name is Sarah Herta. I'm the director of the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, a position Carter himself held for over 22 years. Carter helped create the intellectual and physical fabric of the city. At the Graham Foundation, we live and work with the presence of Carter every day. With the handwritten notes and grant files and his keen observations about projects and ideas written in correspondence to his peers around the country. In fact, nearly every single day, one of our youngest staff members, Zoe, who is working on our archive, comes into my office with a letter by Carter um, of particular interest. And I have to say, we have not yet even chipped the iceberg. In the field of architecture worldwide, we live and work every day among ideas that Carter helped others put into the world, ideas that transformed the field and continue to operate today. In all, over 1,200 grants to support individuals and organizations developing diverse ideas about architecture across the country. These ideas continue to reverberate in every corner of the earth in which architecture is studied and practiced. In the city of Chicago, we live and work among the buildings and spaces Carter helped realize. And in the year that the city of Chicago is celebrating public art, citizens and visitors to the city every day experience the monumental artworks of Picasso, Calder, and Chagall that Carter helped bring into the public realm. Architect, manager, director, curator, author, archivist, and husband, father, grandfather, uncle, friend, and mentor. These are the roles and many more that Carter inhabited in his long life. And it is in these roles that he intersected with all of our lives and our work and in which we will hear more about today from family and friends. Before I th turn things over to Henry, I would like to thank many people that came together to make today possible. Pauline Saliga, Executive Director of the Society of Architectural Historians, especially for the wonderful Remembrance of Carter um, that she wrote and that you can find um, in this program. I would also like to thank Zurich Esposito, Executive Director of the AIA Chicago, and Zoe Ryan, Director of the Department of Architecture and Design at the Art Institute of Chicago for their help in planning this event. And Dean Villaretz, Interim Dean Michelangelo Sabatino, Dirk Dennison, Annie Simmons, and Rick Nelson of IIT for hosting all of us here in this magnific magnificent space. And as, as long as you get inside, I couldn't think of a better place to weather a storm. <laughs> I would also like to thank the Graham Foundation's past and present Board of Trustees. Many um, are with us today and our amazing staff, two of them hired by and worked with Carter, Ron Conow and Carolyn Kelly, as well as Ellen Alderman, Ava Barrett, and James Pike, among others. Most of all, I would like to thank Henry Keene, former president and trustee of the Graham Foundation Board and collaborator and close friend to Carter and Maya. Thank you for working so tirelessly and in constant contact with Maya and Carter's family to bring us all together to celebrate this amazing person. I'd like to welcome Henry to the podium. Before we're done with the thank yous, I wanna thank Sarah for all of her hard work. I mean, when you look around here today, it is all due to Sarah and her staff. How appropriate to be in this building uh, Carter received his architect, or he studied architecture, received an architectural degree here at IIT, and deeply admired this building, this wonderful, wonderful building. We're here to, to, today to honor a truly remarkable man. Though for the past several years he spent uh, in Northern California, it's truly in Chicago that he spent his entire uh, professional life. So it's totally appropriate for us today to feed him in the city that he loved and a building that he so deeply admired. Carter packed an awful lot into his 98 years. He was a man who had close friendships with architects such as Philip Johnson and Caesar Pelley, had interactions during his career with everyone from J. Edgar Hoover to Mayor Daley to Walter Gropius and Buckminster Fuller. 
If you've read your programs yet, he even rode in a circus wagon up Dearborn Street with Alexander Calder. How many in this room have done that? <laughs> I have had the good fortune of knowing Carter for over 40 years at C.F. Murphy and later at the Graham Foundation. We really bonded over the past 15 years as we labored over the project he imagined, which was to discover what became of America's great architects' remains after they died. Our effort resulted in a book that was published a couple of years ago and just recently republished uh, by MIT Press. It was during this project that I became aware of some of Carter's unique qualities, which I'm sure will not be a surprise to anyone here, his incredibly good memory, his marvelous contacts throughout the architectural world, his values, his dignity, his devotion to seeing a job done properly and completely. Today's speakers represent various facets of Carter's life. We're going to lead off with two speakers who can tell of Carter's personal life, uh, his and Maya's good friend Tom Rook, and then Carter's son, Carter. They'll be followed by people who were part of Carter's professional life, Cindy Weiss, John Vinci, John Zukowski, and Tim Samuelson. Our final presenter will be the person Carter shared his life with for the past 21 years, Maya Manny. Tom Rook. Thank you, Henry. And Maya, I first want to give my thanks to you, appreciation that you would invite me to um, speak at this event. Uh, Carter and Maya have been um, features of my life for 25 years now. As a pastor at the Fourth Presbyterian Church here in Chicago, it was uh, in uh, 1993, I believe, that, that Carter and I became acquainted as wife uh, Mary Alice was nearing the end of her life, and uh, Carter invited me into both of their lives, and soon Mary Alice uh, died and I was honored to officiate at her funeral service. I got to know um, son Carter and daughter Liz and have appreciated uh, their friendship as well. After, after the, that experience of uh, ending what was a very long um, um, marriage and two children, um, Carter and Maya developed their friendship over time, and it was on a cold night in December, Maya, two, two days after Christmas, as you would well remember, and the three of us gathered at the Madeliner house, uh, where the Graham Foundation is, on, on that evening, and uh, we stood in front of the fireplace in the entry area, and we had that very intimate, uh, wonderful wedding ceremony, and uh, Carter and Maya began their wedded life together. Well, as I've thought in these past uh, weeks about Carter and, and um, uh, the memories that I would have of him, there's one descriptive word that kept coming back, and it's a word that any of you would uh, associate with Carter, but I'm going to just use that for some of my thoughts, and that is the word gentleman. Gentleman. I, I guess I think of Carter as the quintessential gentleman of the old school, maybe we could say. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's a word that will continue to typify him to me. A gentleman of, of character. Courteous, mild-mannered, unpretentious, genuine, really incapable of any artificiality, I would say. And then addition, additionally, additional to the character, I want us to think in our mind's eye, well, we have a picture of Carter here. 
And we have some wonderful photos in the uh, descriptive uh, brochure, but if you think of Carter in your mind's eye, I think you can see him right now. Uh, well put together, properly attired, dignified, uh, and nicely trim. Well, I'm, I, I just want to—I want to stay on on that that uh, descriptive word for a moment. Trim. Uh, would many of you know that uh, he was not always so svelte as that? <laughs> and I think uh, he would say that himself with that uh, wry signature smile of his. Uh, it was some years ago in his mid-80s when Carter worked on and, and finished and published a book of his boyhood memoirs. And maybe some of you have seen that book. Boy, is that a good read. And it emphasizes what Henry was saying, this uh, superb memory, how Carter could remember all of these boyhood friends and events. But he, he takes, takes us through in that book, takes us through his boyhood in Michigan City, um, Indiana. Well, in, in that, that charming memoir, um, he pokes some self-deprecating uh, fun at himself as an overweight kid. It's hard for us to imagine, but in this regard, um, Carter tells the, this story. I'm going to read just a snippet of a story he tells when he was about 10 years old. And here goes. One day after school, a new kid started pummeling me with his fists. I was mystified what I had done to provoke an attack. Rather than hit back, I decided to use my extra weight to my advantage. And he parenthetically says, I was overweight in those days, and many kids call me fatty and fats to my dismay. I grabbed him in desperation and forced him down, and finally I was able to sit on him and hold him down. We stayed like that for a long time. It was getting dark, and we both knew our mothers would soon worry about us. After he promised to go home without further fighting, I got up and let him go. Well, he continues after that to mention that this fellow never again uh, <laughs> invited a sit-down uh, from Carter. The he Hebrew scriptures describe uh, patriarch Abraham and his son Isaac as each came to the end of their lives. Uh, Hebrew scripture says that they died full of years. And I think that's a wonderful phrase, full of years. And of course, it speaks of the longevity, the length of their lives. We could speak of the length of Carter's life. But I'm convinced it means more than that. I think full of years describes a quality of life, a quality of all those years. And today, we can be thankful that Carter experienced not only a long life, but a full life, a, a life well lived with grace and courtesy and high accomplishment. Carter Manny, a, a true gentleman whom we have been honored to have among us, living with integrity and purpose and goodwill. And I conclude my remarks by quoting from that memoir that I was just mentioning, Carter's own final words in that book. The last lines, I was recently moved when my wife, Maya, read aloud to me Psalm 13. The closing lines of that psalm encapsulate perfectly my feelings as my long life draws to a close. I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath dealt bountifully with me. And now I hand the podium over to Carter.
thank you for those thoughtful comments, Tom. Uh, I plan to tell you about some early influences on my father's life. Of course, his parents topped the list. His father was a conservative businessman by day and a creative free spirit and showman the rest of the time. In retirement, he took up painting. Carter's mother was an amateur singer. The family had lots of friends, including Grant Wood, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Murphy Sr., and members of Frank Lloyd Wright's family. But the most important childhood influence was his, was his mother's mother, Grandmother Barnes, who came to live with the family when Carter was about eight years old. He adored her. She was a woman of many talents, including painting, starting a small business, and even serving as the town's fire chief. <laughs> Grandmother Barnes and her son-in-law, Carter's father, also got along very well. The three of them, grandmother, father, and Carter, all made things in the basement workshop. My father was particularly fond of making models, which he sometimes submitted to willing teachers instead of writing papers. The family was very supportive of their only child and grandchild. Many years later, I mar marveled at how easily my father interacted, not only with his parents, but with anyone from their generation. It was a characteristic that must have been very valuable in his professional life. A fourth relative, an uncle, was influential too, most notably by encouraging Carter to apply to Harvard. The uncle gave his nephew detailed records tracing the family's ancestry back hundreds of years. I think the genealogy had a lot to do with my father's fascination with cemeteries, which led to the architect's graves project um, he pursued at the end of his life. Let's now turn to Carter's time at Harvard. He arrived in Cambridge in the fall of 1937, and the first meeting with his advisor changed his life. After hearing the freshman's plan to start off with courses in history, economics, government, and so forth, the advisor prodded him to see what other classes might balance the reading intensive subjects. What about other interests, he asked. Do you play a musical instrument? No, my father replied. Then what about art? Well, yes, I've made models in my family's workshop. Then you should take the introductory course in fine arts. Trumpets blared, <laughs> lightning flashed, thunder boomed. The fine arts course put my father on his career path. Best of all, he soon learned that the graduate students in architecture were making models of building, buildings, which of course was right up his alley. During the senior year, he was invited to take courses in architecture with the graduate students, which is how he met Philip Johnson, who was a classmate. Back then, would-be architects needed work experience in construction, so following graduation with multiple academic honors in 1941, my father took a summer job in New Jersey which, by the way, was strenuous, dirty, and dangerous. On a weekend visit back to Cambridge that summer, he ran into someone in Harvard Square he'd met freshman year, Mary Alice, who greeted him with one of her incredible smiles. Their romance blossomed during the fall when he returned to Cambridge. Of course, Mary Alice was a big influence on him during their 50 years of marriage. By the end of the summer of 1941, U.S. involvement in the war seemed inevitable. So my father took a break from architecture and entered a one-year program at Harvard Business School, thinking that he'd get ready for the war by developing skills that would be useful in logistics for the Navy. After Pearl Harbor, Harbor however, and while still a business student, he learned that he could not pass a military physical because of a childhood illness. At the end of the school year, a business school professor recruited him to go to Wright Field in Ohio, where, as a civilian working along men in uniform, Carter contributed to designs of fuel systems for airplanes. At the end of 1942, he and Mary Alice got married and lived in a tiny apartment in Dayton. After the war, my father wanted to return to architecture, but it was too late to enroll in fall classes. So instead, he applied for an apprenticeship with Frank Lloyd Wright, which took place in early 1946 at Taliesin West in Arizona. It was a Spartan existence where the apprentices doubled as maintenance staff. My father's after hours job was to rake gravel in the courtyard, 
which he did with a large tree branch he found outside the compound. Mr. Wright commented on the fine job Carter did with the raking. But the record is silent about what he thought about my father's potential as an architect. Returning to Michigan City later that spring, Car Carter renovated the interior of his parents' summer house to get ready for the couple's first child. The renovations were heavily influenced by Wright, including a number of pieces of furniture with which Carter made. He and Mary Alice moved in for the summer, but ended up staying for decades. Finally, I'd like to add a few observations of my own. Although the man we remember today was influenced by the people I've mentioned, my father's many fine qualities came largely from within himself. He had a strong sense of duty and boundless energy. He was especially good in a crisis. Despite many achievements, he was still self-deprecating. He was frugal with himself, but generous with others. He had a very good life and did a tre tremendous amount to improve the lives of people around him. He'll be greatly missed. And now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Cynthia Weiss of Weiss Langley Weiss Architects. That was lovely. Thank you, Carter. I'm very honored to have been asked to speak today to reflect on Carter, a senior, and his legacy at the Graham. I speak also for Ben, uh, who was a board member for 18 years and president for six of those. He worked with Carter literally through thin and thick. Uh, we both celebrate his work and remember Carter fondly. As director of the Graham, Carter made the foundation a welcoming place for innumerable architectural activities. We all looked forward to receiving the notice of upcoming lectures open to all in the fall and spring. Each lecture detailed on an elegantly designed card. In these lectures, we heard from people who were creating architecture and shaping ideas around the world. Symposia were encouraged and frequent, sponsored by a variety of groups, the Chicago Seven, Chicago Women in Architecture, and the AIA. Carter was always open to suggestions for lectures and exhibitions. Informal meetings of architecture-related groups were also welcome. If Nebraska wanted to bring their design awards to Chicago for local judging, they could meet in the dining room. Many remember with great fondness the monthly meetings of the Chicago Architecture Club, where we learned of each other's work and mounted a yearly exhibition of our current projects. Carter's time at the foundation was a time of great architectural activity and commotion in the city, much of which the foundation supported and which happened right there. Without the help of the Graham, the activity and events would not have had as great an impact in the city. Carter also was a superb steward of the Madeliner House. Who does not relish entering the building, marveling at the exquisite metal grate on the door, and on a winter night, holding out their hands to the fire in the foyer, where I just learned you were married, that's lovely, uh, and then on the way up the stair, one always noticed the exquisite wood detailing, and I often touch it, which probably is not the best idea. Gathering with colleagues on the second floor be before uh, a club meeting or after a lecture, checking out the current exhibitions, the house enriched our architectural lives. The many activities were perfectly complemented and reinforced by its quiet elegance. Carter also spent time in restoring the garden and making it the lovely retreat that it is now. Carter was a modest person, yet this modesty belied strong values and a determined commitment to the foundation and its continuing excellence. He was also extremely honest. At one point, he detected problems and brought them to light. He did not sweep them under the rug. As a result, the foundation came under the scrutiny of the Illinois Attorney General for not fulfilling its charter. There were rumors of a merger with another Chicago institution. This was a very difficult time for Carter, yet he faced it with great honesty and directness and courage. At the height of all this, he gathered together several architects, including Ben, to get their advice. Someone suggested sending a letter to all past Graham grant recipients to solicit their support for the work of the foundation. 
Someone else suggest, suggested enclosing a stamped address postcard for their response. Ben and I sat at our dining room table one Saturday afternoon on a day like this and stuffed the envelopes. The return address was our office. The replies flooded in in the weeks to follow, varying from a few words dashed off by a leading architect to as much as would, would fit on the card in spidery handwriting from an elderly historian. All were sincerely grateful and highly praised the importance of, the, of Graham Grants to their work. These encomia were given to the Attorney General and along with Carter's personal integrity and reputation helped make the ruling that the foundation could remain, remain independent. Truly a fortunate decision for current and future generations of scholars. A quick personal note. I first attended a Graham lecture in the spring of 64, 1964, before Carter became director with Ben and Jack Hartray. Ben and I were newly married and I was finishing my architectural studies. As we walked into the top floor lecture room, we were approached by the then Graham director, not Carter. Uh, this man looked down his nose at me and said, wives are not encouraged to attend lectures. <laughs> Both Ben and Jack retorted, she's an architect, which was very flattering to me because I still considered my, myself a student, and I was grudgingly left in, let in. Nothing remotely like this happened under Carter. Indeed, 14 years later, the Graham made the initial grant to fund the first show of Chicago Women Architects. A grant from the Graham was and is an extreme honor, one that validates activities and scholarship alike. I worked with Carter reading grants for a year, the submissions show the impressive range of thinking and scholarship nationally and internationally. They've varied from the most theoretical investigations to research on the French railway, the French chemin de fer. Carter worked hard to be fair and open. He truly was theory neutral. As a result, a level of trust was established in how grants were awarded. A Graham grant is highly regarded by other grant institutions. It's often the first grant an architect or scholar will seek in, in order that he or she can say, I have a Graham grant, and uh, that will mean a great deal. These awards have had a major impact on architectural thinking for decades. Through his actions as director and his personal integrity, Carter gave the foundation consistency, reliability, and stability. As Ben says, he was a force, forward thinking and committed. His leadership established a le level of excellent excellence that continues today, decades after his tenure. We all owe him a great deal. Thank you, Carter. Our next speaker is John Vinci. Hello, I'm John Vinci. Um, I need to take a breath here. Uh, it's difficult to choose words to describe Carter Manny's wonderful attributes, uh, since there are so many, his respect for memory comes to mind. When Carter became director of the Graham Foundation, he, I, I have to get closer, he took several projects to enhance the foundation's presence. Among the projects in mind, he had the inspiration to renovate the courtyard of the Graham Foundation, originally designed by Dan Brenner and Deva Rockwell, whom I worked for. And by adding, uh, and he did this by adding more significant architectural fragments. Being made aware that Thomas Talmadge's book, Architecture in Old Chicago, mentioned that a fragment from H.H. H. Richardson's Marshall Field Warehouse was saved by the Lake Zurich Country Club member, Carter went about conning the fragment for the, for the garden. He then set out acquiring one of the enormous capitals from the Adler and Sullivan's Walker Warehouse. In 1953, Ralph Marlow Line, a professor at Champaign-Urbana, had received two capitals from the building and it, when it was coming down in about 1953. Unwittingly, the salvagers took two of the same capitals, uh, same design on them. Carter again managed to have the university donate one of them uh, to the Graham Foundation garden. A huge crane was necessary to deliver and install the massive stone. Seeing that the firm of Ernest Graham was 
not represented, he became aware of the five foot tall acritarians that uh, were on top of the field museum designed by Graham Anderson, Propes, and White were being replaced and he acquired a whole assembly. Tim Samuelson and my partner Phil Hamp could add more to this story, but our favorite incident occurred when he realized that a fragment that was acquired from Adler and Sullivan's Rothschild building was missing its central floret. He devised adding a salad bowl surrounded by golf balls to complete the <laughs> to complete the ornament. <laughs> this lasted for a while until it was redone in steel, by the way. It's in the, uh, it's in the brochure uh, that he did on the Madeliner House. At the entrance of the Graham Foundation, he felt the plinths flanking the entrance lack definition. There he designed prairie school style urns and placed them on the plinths. Later, when he heard the urns were removed, he sent me the following message. I don't fret over the removal of the urns from Madlander House, as he referred to the Graham Foundation headquarters, but I still believe they were a good addition. When I look at the Hedrick Blessing photo on the cover of the Madlander booklet, I realize you approved and helped with correcting the curvature of the pedestal. Uh, my guess is that the urns were removed because of deterioration of the stone underneath but maybe some people just didn't like them. They had the refuge of original authenticity to justify removal, but I think Brenner, you assisting, improved on history as, did with the, as I did with the urns. As for the loss of the urns, I console myself, the original still exists at Tomac and Roby, and there's, they're the ones and, the, and there, the one I created for my family plot in Michigan City, where I expect to be before long, Bess Carter. <laughs> there was another project that Carter sent me drawings for my opinion. He proposed adding markers in Graceland Cemetery commemorating his colleagues at CF Murphy. Uh, there, they were Stan Gladish, Jack Bronson, and I believe Gene Summers. Uh, he succeeded in getting the Gladish and Brownson families to agree. They placed, they're placed in the same area along with Richard Nickel, Fosler Kahn, Walter Netsch, Bruce Graham, and Mies van der Rohe. Um, and there, are, along with them, are the names of Stan Gladish and Jack Bronson. Uh, Carter could, could be persistent he nagged me constantly regarding the completion of the Adler and Sullivan book begun by Aaron Siskin and Richard Nickel. This was finally achieved by Ward Miller and myself in 2010. On this occasion, he was sent the first copy. He was elated. Maya wrote, what, an, what an, a work. I just want you to know I nearly needed a dolly to get the box inside the, uh, the, that contained the, bo the book. Congratulations, most heartful as well as thanks. I have known Maya since the early 70s. We met when she and John Moran purchased the Frank Lloyd Wright Tomac house in Riverside. Subsequently left on her own, she proceeded to have the derelict house restored bit by bit. And of course, at the same time, she was raising her four sons, Thomas, Peter, John, and Michael. She created the most extraordinary garden and most beautiful paintings of the house and garden. Eventually managed to have the deteriorating porches rebuilt. She managed to replace the stucco with the correct texture. And among other projects, she designed the kitchen. She referred to herself at the time as the maintenance woman. Uh, when Carter's wife, Mary Alice, died, Maya called me to ask if, we, if I would accompany her to the memorial service. And as we know, the rest is history. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, John Zukowski.
Thanks, John. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. It really is an honor. Um, I think of all the work Carter did, it's just absolutely amazing to me when you think of it. And we've heard the words today about duty and being a gentleman, about um, uh, honesty and trust. And it's all true, definitely, in terms of my experiences with Carter over the decades at the Graham. You know, I came here in 1978 when I was 30 years old and made my architectural pilgrimage, stopping at Falling from New York to Chicago, stopping at Falling Water, Wheeling, West Virginia to see it a rolling bridge, and Columbus, Indiana, of course, stopping at all these pilgrimage sites. And I lived in Sandburg Village when I moved here. I, mean, I remember I rented the biggest car that I could find, which was a Chevy Impala, and loaded up all my worldly belongings, you know, my architecture books and some clothes and a compact TV and a couple of um, you know, cement bricks and wood shelves for uh, the bookshelves, and um, shoved them all in the trunk, locked up the trunk, put a chain around the lock, you know, because there were precious belongings in there, and all those architecture books, and uh, drove here, making this pilgrimage along the way. Uh, the most exciting time on the, on the trip was stopping in Kokomo, Indiana. When I put the chain in the trunk, I cut my hand, and uh, I made um, the evening at the emergency room in Kokomo um, giving my exploits about moving across the country. <laughs> so I came here and rented a, a, a small studio in Sandburg Village, which was right near the Graham. And it, was, it blew me away. It was amazing to me to go to these programs. I mean, think about this, just like S Cindy, uh, Cindy Weiss was talking about. The programs at the Graham were absolutely astonishing to me. Coming from New York, being a jaded New Yorker in many ways, you'd see these lecturers and architects from around the globe You'd see exhibits that you'd never dreamt of even seeing before. Absolutely incredible, and, and it's amazing. This is a great, to me, it's, it's a great legacy of Carter's that continues today in what you've been doing at the Graham. I mean, think about it. Where can you, if you're a student here or an architect, where can you see all these things? It's, it's astonishing to me. So that, you know, I would walk up and down the streets going to, to the Art Institute at work, walking at different streets every day to see different buildings, but also going whenever I could to the Graham for these lectures, which are amazing. Um, I'm also, you know, thinking of the Madeliner House and think of, you know, I'm glad John talked about what was done at the Madeliner House and what Carter did. That's also pretty astonishing, and the house itself is a great gem um, when you think of it. But what was really important to me about the Madeliner House is that Carter was very generous in opening it to all these different groups from around the city. I remember going to Chicago Architectural Club lectures there. I remember going to these different events from the AIA there, so different exhibits that people hosted there that were not the Graham exhibits. So this was an incredible opportunity, again, a learning opportunity, when you're a young student or a young professional to see all this stuff going on, not just around the world, as the Graham brought in these people, but in your own city to see what's happening. And Carter was, was all about that. There's no doubt about it. Now, I came to the Art Institute in 1978 to be architectural archivist and didn't head the curatorial department there until 1982 when the department was created. And Carter was instrumental in creating that department. He was part of a self-study, which then it was called the self-study at the Art Institute. It's essentially a strategic planning study. He was part, part of a strategic planning group that uh, he was one of the outside advisors on the group with trustees and senior staff at the Art Institute. Um, they were the ones responsible to convince Jim Wood, who was director then, to create a department of architecture, the second such curatorial department of architecture in the nation after MoMA, which was created 50 years before, or about 50 years before. So, you know, in a lot of ways, Carter was a great supporter of there, but we always have to remember that that department, in a way, started with him and other trustees and Jim Wood, quite honestly, in making that happen. Carter was on the Advisory Committee for Architecture, which was established after the um, department was created at the Art Institute. And everybody knows, I mean, I can't think of all the grants that Graham supported in terms of our own efforts, the oral history grants, exhibits, books, the construction of the Graham Study Center for Architecture. Um, absolutely astonishing, and obviously we're, we were all very grateful for his support that way and for the Graham's support. But what we have to remember, too, it's not just us that he supported. 
He supported everybody in the city. It's, again, an astonishing record. The History Museum, which was then the Historical Society, his support in terms of his support through the Graham of what they were doing with architecture. Uh, the, the Chicago Architecture Foundations at the Glessner House. Think tanks in the city, like the Chicago Architectural Club, where they could meet. Uh, supporting universities, supporting Threshold, the publication of the University of Illinois in architecture. It was amazing when you think of it. Uh, the, the 1980s and 90s uh, were astonishing decades to be here, but also because of his support and his thoughtfulness in terms of helping people in the city make Chicago what it is today, in terms of this great capital of American architecture. So we've heard, you know, stories about him. We've heard his qualities. To me, he was a real brick about architecture. And even more than a brick, he's a great building stone, a cornerstone of many of these efforts in the city. He was a good listener, but he actively participated in helping shape Chicago. And dialogue, to me, leads and leading to this kind of sharing of information in the city and what's going on. He did that to a T. It's amazing. Um, and it leads to creative solutions for common problems that all these institutions had. So what he helped to bring to the city and to architecture was dialogue and a kind of consistent devotion to architecture and a consistent love of Chicago. And he really left something, um, he left something great behind for all of us to enjoy. So to me, he'll always, always be remembered for that. And I'd like to introduce Tim Samuelson, who'll speak next. A lot of my experience with Carter is in the field of architectural history, although we had many wonderful conversations on all kinds of topics, which were a great part of my personal education. Listening to the talks of people who have spoken before comes to mind many words that really resonate with me. Gentleman, certainly a gentleman. Somebody who was ingenious and a good craftsman, I was at my house when the doorbell rang and there was Carter showing me the replacement flower for a piece of Sullivan ornament made out of two salad bowls with golf balls around the side, which he had carefully covered up the dimples so that they were completely smooth. <laughs> it was later replaced by a work by a professional artist I prefer the salad bowl and the golf balls, and I still hope they exist somewhere. Now, when I think one of the great gifts that I had was being able to work with Carter in the development of the courtyard with the architectural ornament, tracking down pieces, then getting their stories, putting them up on the wall. And Carter was also somebody of great curiosity and somebody who was open to a new adventure. And one thing that I really remember is when we were working on the courtyard and all of these pieces that had been salvaged years ago by people like Richard Nickel and John Vinci, he really said to me, you know, one thing I've never done is gone on an architectural salvage. Could you let me know and let me go with you sometime? So one day, there's a building getting knocked down at 37th and Wentworth, right along the expressway. It had terracotta on the top, which had been relocated from the Tacoma building, one of the early skyscrapers of Chicago. Had to get these things, the building's getting knocked down. I said, Carter, you really want to go along on a salvage? Oh, yes, I would. Well, this was like a mini Graham Grant. <laughs> there was no money involved, but I got the Graham van, I got Roger, who we worked with on many different projects, and Carter himself. Meet me at 37th and Wentworth, 7.30 in the morning. See you there, said Carter. Van pulls up right at 7. Carter, one thing is punctual. Carter's always on time. Now, I'm actually going to look as audience participation in telling this story, because I think people who know Carter will be able to fill in the last line and give the quotation of what Carter said. Because before we went on the adventure and I talked on the phone to Carter, 
I says, now Carter, this is a really dirty demolition site. Says, this is the top of the parapet and there's tar and mess on. I said, be sure to wear your old clothes. So now the Graham Foundation van pulls up right on time. The door opens and out comes Carter Manny in a beautiful three-piece suit. <laughs> I said, Carter, I said to wear your old clothes. He just gave a smile. He stood like this. And he said, these are my old clothes. <laughs> that was just wonderful. But wearing those old clothes, now he probably had meetings the same day. He was just of a gentleman. He didn't tell me that. But he was there lifting bricks, hauling big pieces into the van. And even for all that work, his white shirt was still clean. The suit was impeccable. <laughs> I was, meanwhile, I was just covered in filth. But the other thing with Carter, there was an amazing advantage to be somebody who was engaged and involved in architecture who had a lifespan of almost 100 years going from 1918 to 2017. And so he became my real direct telephone contact to the entire range of Chicago architectural history. So I could call up Carter on the phone. I could say, hello, Carter. And we'd talk about something I was working on. And it might be something about years before Carter was even born but he had connections to people who were still alive and being engaged who knew the pioneers of Chicago architecture. He could quote what was said by Andy Rabori or Hugh Garden because he knew them. He also could relate stories that were told to him, and he would recount with great accuracy, of things that were said by long gone people like Daniel Burnham and Louis Sullivan. The information I was able to get was something that you will never get from any thesis, you will never find on Wikipedia, because the stories would give you the sense of architecture as the work of real people. It filled in the stories of the people who created, what they were like, their personalities. The same thing too, in terms of Carter's own professional time in professional architectural practice. I would be researching buildings, and I would find a man like Gerald Siegwart. Nobody asks about Gerald Siegwart, or Spencer Cohn, or the wonderfully named Ivar Viennese. And I could call up Carter, and oh, I knew them. He would know their buildings, he would be able to describe them, so that I could almost see them standing before me and fill in the story and give my understanding of these architecture, this architecture both as great architecture, but also as the people behind them. And even for contemporary things, if I'd call up with a question, like, hello, Carter, and we talk about, and he would go, say, well, let me call up Helmut about that. I'll be able to find out, or Bill Hartman. He got together with me to a project at Harvard, calls up Philip Johnson. I mean, it was just amazing. So there is this whole thing of Carter was my special telephone to history. And you know what? Everything he said, everything that he told me, in fact, now we have these amazing phones. We're still connected today. He's still here. So basically what I'm doing is taking my cell phone that takes things out into the ether and just say, hello, Carter. Just checking in. By the way, I'm here with some people that really want to send a big hello, their respect, and their love. Want me to put them on the line? <laughs> so. And speaking of love, I now present Maya Manning. The first thing I want to do is to express my thanks to you all for coming here and joining me in celebrating Carter's long and good life. And here I'm, I'm repeating a quote because uh, Tom Rook took the words out of my mouth. Um, 
if you read Carter's boyhood memoir, or it's called A Boyhood Revisited, and it's online at the Art Institute, by the way, of Chicago, he ends it with the quote, which I will repeat, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has dealt bountifully with me. And that's how Carter felt all his life. And the second thing is I want to thank all the people who have organized this event. And there are too many to mention. Besides Carter's best friend, who is still alive, Henry Kuhn. Carter often complained he didn't know any more people who were alive. But I see now that there are quite a few <laughs> left who he has touched, whose lives he has touched. And then I would like to thank my husband, posthumously, I suppose, because I neglected to do so when he was still alive, for saving my life. Carter's reaction to my stumbling back to our bed after I'd visited the bathroom was saying, I'm having a stroke, I'm having a stroke. That was to push the button on his great call alert system that I'd gotten for him because I wanted somebody to be alerted when I was swimming three times a week and marketing and not with him. A receptionist answered and he told her I was having a stroke. She asked, is she bleeding? Or had she fallen? I still had ears to hear that. And I heard Carter say, lady, this is no time for questions. It's time for action, and if you do not call 911 right away, I will. <laughs> yes, sir, she said. And she did so. By the time the ambulance arrived, I no longer could walk, talk, or hear on my right side. I can walk and talk somehow, but I do not hear yet on my right side. But Carter saved my life, of which he had become the axle. When he went into the hospital for his third pacemaker, I asked the surgeon if he could not clone him so that other women could be as happy as I have been. Several of you have commented that we were the perfect pair together 24-7, intellectually, socially, aesthetically, and morally so well matched. That was Marty, by the way. Our circadian rhythms were the same. In 1994, I wrote my own Carol that Carter was that last piece in the jigsaw puzzle that you thought was missing. You were sure it wasn't there. Must have been vacuumed up, fell under the radiator, or it was lost some time ago. And then you found it. You found it. And it made the picture complete. Now I can write on the puzzle box, as my grandmother used to do in her curly, old-fashioned handwriting, one piece missing. He was the right man, pun intended. There are some things you may not know <coughs> about Carter one of them you do about his love of the workshop, but he did not die of old age. He died of computeritis. It is a new disease, somewhat contagious, which affects people who only get up from their desk three times a day when they have to get to the table to eat a healthy, sometimes delicious meal. Then the meal is followed by sitting down again to keep to play a game of solitaire, to keep his brain sharpened, you see. He played Miss Milligan after breakfast, Churchill after lunch, and 40 Thieves, Napoleon's favorite game, after dinner. When my son Peter installed Carter's Apple computer, he suggested to Carter that he gets up every 20 minutes, where's Peter, there, and walk up and down the hall a few times. Carter used to often walk two miles, but late in his 90s, he became truly addicted to his computer. He got edema in his legs and that looked like elephantitis had set in. And so he needed a walker to get to the table. Walking is the cure for this disease. Besides doing a few stretches 
and refocusing your eyes. Had he done that, he might have lived 210. You may not know that Carter loved having a workshop to putter in. He made lots of wonderful toys for his grandson, Will, for other children, and his seven step-grandchildren. A complete sand operation, music stands, Christmas toys, boats in bottles, an assortment of whirly gigs, a roundhouse for Thomas the Tank Engine, light fixtures, plant stands, dining room chairs, and a sandbox to play in. Many are documented in one, in a small scrapbook, one of some 65 that he donated to the Ryerson and Burnham Libraries in the Art Institute of Chicago, where they soon should be. Carter was most reluctant to move away from his beloved log, log cabin property with studio and guest house on a tall dune in Indiana to a small one-level house in California, but he knew that the eye specialist expected him to be totally blind in two years. He already had lost vision in one eye, but injections every three months for 13 years kept his other one going. Much to the ophthalmologist's amazement, he did not go blind. The doctor asked what I had been feeding him. An apple a day, an abundance of fruit, vegetables, and a piece of good dark Belgian chocolate <laughs> every twice daily. Another reason for moving was that my surgeon at Press St. Luke said that I needed another back operation, and with Carter unable to drive to Chicago, we moved to California, where we then still had two unmarried sons, no longer, but who suggested we stop the shoveling of snow. Only after we had bought the house there that I did find out from the surgeons in San Francisco that I was inoperable because of arthritis. When Carter was not visiting, the oncologist, the pharmacist, the internist, the dermatologist, the dentist, and others, he was constantly at his computer, digging up facts and people, connecting persons, and responding immediately to correspondence or phone calls. I, re I think I remember even the Malcolm you wanted a picture of Malcolm, uh, something that had been destroyed, and Carter knew just in which book it was. But anyhow, sometimes he did not run by his writings, by his personal editor, because she was per baking bread. So there were quite a few typos in the text that accompanied the scrapbook photos or his correspondence, so that the person who, the volunteer who has to um, uh, uh, do Carter's uh, look through all these scrapbooks. I feel sort of sorry for them, but I, I know that there are mistakes. He could find a needle in a haystack, a grave in an obscure cemetery, cemetery <laughs> raise funds, and in his 90s did design and order gravestones for Stan Gladich, where is Susan? There she is. And and his daughter, and Jacques Bronson. Carter was distressed to learn that only a piece of paper was displayed on Rafael Soriano's grave, and he tried to raise funds three years ago for that. Michael Lucas at Cal Poly told me after Carter had died that this had now had begun. And we could all leave a dollar, and, and, but I'm not into fundraising. I no longer no, remember when it was exactly that he said something funny that stuck with me. It might have been before his seizure that led to the discovery of a non-malignant brain tumor the size of a tennis ball at age 87. It, its removal must have made much more room in the hippocampus for his most remarkable memory, so that explains that. No. Maybe it was before I had major back surgery in Marin County that my surgeon said I might be blind, cured, or dead. 
that was uh, not a very nice bedside manner, but <laughs> Carter said, if you dare to die before me, I will divorce you. <laughs> but I didn't dare. Carter was often perseverant. <laughs> it's a word I've heard before. At times, stubborn, an impatient man who wanted to get things done yesterday. Caroline will, <laughs> will vouch for that. But he was so approachable. He was not tall. He did not have broad shoulders. He had no chips on them. Maybe he was so likable because his right upper lip was a bit enlarged and tilted up so that it looked like it was always ready to break into a smile. It was so even after he had died. I kissed him three times, but my prince did not wake up. He was a noble man. He was a prince of a man. And on behalf of my entire family, I thank you all for coming. That's it. Since several have mentioned Carter's family, uh, I think you've, you've obviously uh, heard from Maya, you've heard from Carter Jr. Elizabeth Manny, Carter's daughter, would you stand up so everybody could see who you are? <laughs> and then Maya's four sons are here as well. Why don't the four of you stand up? Great. Thanks very much. So for the rest of you, thank you. Thank you very much to coming out today, and it stopped raining, it looks like, to celebrate the life of this truly remarkable man. The speakers you have heard all have represented different facets of Carter's life, a very rich and full life. And it, for me, it's, it's truly an honor for me to be, have been accepted by him into what was a rich and truly rewarding friendship. I urge you to stick around uh, and enjoy the refreshments that we have. Find old friends uh, at this exceptional gathering. This group is, does not assemble very often, for sure. And also make sure to take a look at the special slideshow that uh, Carter's family has put together in the back here. I urge you all to put on name tags to sign the guest book. The reason for the name tags is everybody looks a little bit different if you haven't seen them for 20 years. <laughs> And make sure to sign the guest book so the family has a record of your having been here. Thank you all very, very much. Okay.